Hi, it's Carol from bookreporter.com and we're bringing you a very different program this week. Simon & Schuster asked me to moderate their spring festival program where the interviews were going to be with Nelson DeMille and Janet Ivanovich. Nelson I've known for years, he's a very good friend and Janet is an author who we've been reviewing since book one. So I welcome the opportunity to do this. And they're courtesy of them, we're able to share this discussion with you today. So they're gonna be talking about their books that are out now, what they've done throughout their careers and what's coming next. The Maze from Nelson DeMille behind me and Going Rogue from Janet Ivanovich. So enjoy everyone. And thanks again to Simon & Schuster for sharing this program with us. Hello and welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you. I am Jonathan Karp, the CEO of Simon & Schuster. And this is Author Fest, which is our way of bringing authors to a national audience of people who love books. And the idea for BookFest was to find authors who are so beloved and so popular that they actually don't have time to get to the literary festivals because there's such demand for them and also because they are very busy writing their books. And in this instance, we have two of the most beloved and most popular novelists at work today. Um, Janet Ivanovich and Nelson DeMille, they are both Simon & Schuster authors. They both have books coming out this year. Janet is published by Atria and Nelson is published by Scribner. And um, they are going to be introduced by uh, the moderator of this event, who is Carol Fitzgerald. And Carol Fitzgerald is the president and founder of the Book Report Network, which is a group of websites about books and authors, including bookreporter.com and readinggroupguys.com. And I recommend them both very highly, um, bookreporter.com and readinggroupguides.com. They've become the gathering places for a large and devoted community of book lovers since 1996. Carol is known for her in-depth author interviews. In 2019, the company launched the Book Reporter Talks To video podcast series, which she hosts. And in 2020, Bookachino Live, a lively talk about books, a book preview program, and Bookachino Live, a live book group event, were added to the company's video programming. And uh, if you ever want to talk to anybody about books, Carol is the person to talk to them about. Carol, thank you so much for doing this and welcome. Take it away. Jonathan, thank you so much. It's so good to see you. Um, and welcome to everybody. So nice to have you here tonight. A few quick things about the format for this evening's event. I'm gonna speak with our author guests until about 8.45. And after that, I'm gonna go some of the questions that were pre-submitted from readers. I have to say, you have some great questions. Really good job, folks. The chat button that you see that is available down below, you're going to be chatting amongst yourselves. Please note that those of us who are on screen up here are not seeing those comments. And with that little bit of housekeeping behind us, I have my pleasure to introduce to well, two well-known and well-loved authors for our guests for this evening. So first, we have Janet Ivanovich, who is a fellow Jersey girl. Yes, we both have roots in the same place. Over the last 25 years, Janet, a number one New York Times bestselling author, has written a staggering 28 novels in the Stephanie Plum series, with number 29, Going Rogue, coming November 1st. She has just published the first book in a brand new series featuring Gabriella Rose called The Recovery Agent. In addition to the Plum novels, Janet has co-authored the New York Times bestselling Fox and O'Hare series, the Night and Moon series, the Lizzie and Diesel series, the Alexandra Barber, Barber, Barnaby novels, and the graphic novel Troublemaker with her daughter, Alex Ivanovich. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. And now let me introduce my good friend, Nelson DeMille, who is the New York Times bestselling author of 21 novels, six of which were number one New York Times bestsellers. His novels include The Deserter, which was written with his son, Alex DeMille, The Cuban Affair, Word of Honor, Plum Island, The Charm School, The Gold Coast, and The General's Daughter, which was made into a major motion picture starring John Travolta. Nelson is combat decorated US Army veteran and his next book, The Maze, see over my shoulder, uh, featuring his much loved uh, character, John Corey, will be on sale on October 11th. So welcome, Nelson. Thank you, Carol. So, so great to have you both here. I'm gonna start with a question about, you both have created these iconic characters. For you, Nelson, it's John Corey, who first appeared in Plum Island and we'll be back in the maze. 
And Janet, Stephanie Plum will have made 29 appearances by this fall. So let's talk about how you started creating them. And Janet, um, I just want you to know that I found the review that we did for One for the Money on Book Reporter years ago. And I just want you to know that we call the character a refreshing, sassy new female investigator. So we, we were with you right from the beginning. Sassy. She was sassy. <laughs> sassy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what inspired creating her? Where did they come from? Well, I started out as a romance writer. And so I, um, I, I knew some of the things about characters that I enjoyed reading about um, and that I wanted to um, take with me when I left romance. And then I saw the movie Midnight Run with Charles Grodin and Robert De Niro. And that was what gave me the idea to make my heroine a, a bounty hunter. Um, and, you know, just kind of, took off from there, you know, and, and there's a little bit of me in there too, cause I'm a Jersey girl and um, you know, she's Stephanie Plum is um, braver than I am. And she's uh, doesn't have the metabolism issues that I have. She's younger than I am, you know, but we come from the same place. So um, I put a lot of um, myself in, into that heroine. Now, and it comes across that it's a very realistic heroine. You've got some, really um, fun little things that she does along the way, including, well, we'll get into more about what she does later on. Um, Nelson, what inspired John Corey? Well, a good question. I mean, um, first of all, I, I had never done a series character before. Um, the first John Corey, which is Plum Island, was meant to be a standalone, like all my prior novels. And um, after it came out, the the response to John Corey was so overwhelming. Uh, my publisher, you know, said, you got to do a second one and a third. And, and this is not what I wanted to do, but I could see that this, I touched on something with, the, with this character. John Corey is politically incorrect to begin with. He says things that I could not get away with in real life, but he gets away with it on the page. Uh, he is a, he's a smart ass. Uh, women like him. Women love him. Men like him. Uh, this is one of those things you you don't know where he came from. I have no idea where he came from. Deep in my subconscious, some places where John Corey came from. But when I was, I was writing it, I realized I kind of realized I was onto something. But the sales and the reader response and emails, you know, kind of uh, affirmed that I I was now going to become a writer of a new series uh, called the John Corey series, and it worked. You know, I'm on uh, the maze is actually number eight now. Number eight. Wow. Can't believe it. So uh, Janet, when you launched a new series recently called The Recovery Agent with a new character. So tell us about Gabriella Rose. I was reading this book the other night and I said, it's really interesting to see somebody where I've read the Plum books and say, whoa, new character, new direction. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, Gabrielle Rose is everything that Stephanie isn't. She's um, a fashionista. She's a gourmet cook. She's a martial arts expert. She's very good at what she does. She's um, sort of this, she was this daredevil kid who grew up and found out she was very good at finding things. And, um, and she is very good and she's very successful at it. She's um, got a certain lifestyle behind her now. She has a condo in New York City. She travels all over the world. It's a series that I've been wanting to do for a long, long time because, I mean, I love Jersey. I'm from Jersey. I like Stephanie. But, um, you know, it's sort of like living in a living in a closet, living in a phone booth. You know, remember phone booths and you <laughs> could look outside, but you were still in a little phone booth. And um, so I wanted to do this big worldwide adventure story. And um, that, so that's, you know, that's sort of where I'm going with this new series. It's, I think it's very Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. Exactly what I was thinking when I was reading it. And it's got that opener where something happens and you're just there like, oh, that's like a moment. It's like a really great moment. And she is in a very different place. And I immediately picked up on, hmm, this is a very different character going in completely different directions. She can go anywhere in the world where Stephanie can't. Stephanie's got her rules. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what she does is, um, you know, Stephanie kind of got into her job um, by the back door. Um, she, she never really had aspirations for anything. She doesn't, she kind of puts one foot in front of the other. And um, I mean, and I think what's one of the reasons why people love her because we really relate to her. Mm 
Um, but this Gabriella Rose is, you know, is not like that. She's driven. She has aspirations. She likes her lifestyle. She loves adventure. She was stalked by a panther in the opening of the book. And she's very excited about it because it was on her birthday. Um, you know, she she ends up carrying a chopped off hand in her backpack because um, she can't she can't get the amulet out of this guy's fist. So so they whack off his hand and she's carrying it around. You know, she has she has a lot of guts. She's um, she was just, a, you know, a breath of fresh air for me just to have a, an entirely new and different character. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing the next book in it because I really I really had fun with this. Have you mapped out where she's going to go next? Do you have like notes around of, oh, we could send her here or there? And maybe these places you might be able to go at some point. Yeah, I, you know, I don't because I'm writing um, The Plum now. I'm writing Going Rogue. And I, I have like limited capacity up here. So I only can do one thing at a time. I finish a book and I kind of dump the whole thing and then start off on a new project. But there are tons of places. I mean, this is like I'm living vicariously through this woman. And when I originally got the idea to do this, I thought, oh, man, I'm going to go to Peru. I'm going to go to um, St. Vincent, um, you know, all of these places and do research. And then COVID hit. And uh, and I ended up Googling everything. And so uh, so I don't know. So maybe, you know, now that the world is opening up there, there are a lot of places that I that I would like to take this next book, but haven't settled in on one. You know, just Gabriella, where are we going now? Where in the world are we going together? You know, it sounds you can perfect. Go anywhere. Yes. <laughs> Someplace very civilized. Like maybe maybe it should start out in London. I haven't been there in a while. Mm, see, you just plan your adventures together. Uh, what do you think we're going to do? I think we'll go here. Yeah, let's say. Yeah. And maybe Italy after after London. Yeah. <laughs> so readers, just know that that's where you may be going. So go buy the first book. Let's make it a huge success so we can go to all these other places. Yeah, for sure. So Nelson, what can you tell us to expect of the maze? I, I have gotten a chance to read 200 pages. And John Corey's just oh. as irreverent as usual, but I okay. uh, just got the humor. So tell us what we're going to see in the maze. Yeah, and I, yeah, I should have added before John Corey is he's got the New York mouth he, he, he's former NYPD and I know a lot of cops and this is the way they talk and you kind of pick it up and I, I love the, the expression New York mouth and this is this is John Corey so um, John Corey in this this is kind of a return to Plum Island which was the first of the John Corey books and one of was supposed to be standalone he's back on the North Fork of Long Island, and he runs into his old lover from Plum Island. So it's kind of a full circle type of thing. But to cut to the chase, what I did is I took the Gilgo Beach murders uh, that we all know about. I mean, they've become nationally famous. Uh, and nine, actually 10 uh, women who, most of them were probably sex workers, were found murdered uh, and uh, disposed of on Gilgo Beach remote section a section of Gilgo Beach on Long Island. And this case is now 10 years old, um, 10 murders, 10 years old, and they're no closer to solving this case than they were 10 years ago when the body started turning up. So uh, I changed the venue a little bit to Fire Island, and I put John Corey in the middle of it. So John Corey is going to solve the Gilgo Beach murders, but now they're the Fire Island murders. And it's very difficult, as Janet, I'm sure, if you've done this, to take a real incident, like I took TWA 800 crash and I wrote uh, Nightfall. Yeah, you got to deal with the facts at the same time. You got to fictionalize it. And, and it's really more of a challenge in creating a book out of whole cloth. So, and you want to be sensitive too. TWA, for instance, you had 230, you know, uh, victims. And uh, with this, you have, you know, 10 women and their families. So you want to be sensitive, but you want to, you know, you're dramatizing it for a reason too. hopefully bringing some, you know, some light on this thing from a novelist standpoint. And, uh, and at the same time, it was be entertaining. So Corey has found himself in two uh, famous historical instances, well, historical meaning T.W.A. and Hunter Crash, and now the Gilgo Beach murders. And does he solve the Gilgo Beach murders at the end? Uh, not sure. I don't think so. But uh, we'll know on October 11th when I put the finishing, before I put the finishing touches on it. 
I do love at the beginning, he's going everywhere with his Glock because he's convinced the Russians are coming to get him. So he goes right. to the beach, That's every different. place he goes, he's packing. And I was like, I really love that, you know? Every place we're gonna go. And he's like, are you carrying or I'm carrying? So when you go out with your girlfriend, it's kind of interesting to say, who's carrying what before we leave the house, right. you know? So- Well, that's it too, because of the, um, the, the case, the prior case in the prior book, Radiant Angel had to do with the Russians. And um, it had to do with, the SVR, which is the successor to the KGB, you know, it's happening now in Russia, it was happening, you know, in Ukraine. Uh, it's kind of, you know, we see the, we really weren't sure the Russians were really that bad, you know, is this, is this Cold War, you know, 2 0 or, or is it not? Well, now we know it is. But Corey saw this three, four years ago on Radiant Angel, and he, he had gone into this nasty case with the Russians that were, and he killed a bunch of SVR agents. So now when we see him and, the maze, he's always looking over his shoulder uh, because he knows that the SV, he's convinced that the SVR over his right shoulder would like to knock him off. But also the CIA, who he's PO'd a couple of times, uh, are his sworn arch enemies. So he's got, <laughs> he's got this guy, has got more enemies than he has friends, but uh, but he doesn't care. He's, uh, he's a tough guy and he's got his Glock and he's a funny guy. So it's, 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 uh, this is the, the people who read this book keep writing to me. Is that you? Are you that sarcastic? <laughs> and I always say you have to you have to ask my two ex wives. I'm not sure if I'm not sarcastic, but it's kind of fun. It is like my alter ego, and I do have fun uh, having Corey say things that I wish I could say and get away with. Yeah, and he's just like chomping right at the bit. He's going from there. Right. So you've both written with your children. You've both written with children named Alex, which makes it even right. more interesting. So what's it like when you don't have mouse control, Janet? You're not mousing around. And Nelson, when you've got the pencil. So let's start with you, Janet. What's it like when you're working with somebody else? Um, well, working with Alex, I mean, that was just joy because she's very talented and she did all the heavy lifting. And, um, and that was one of my favorite projects because I'm a big graphic novel, comic book fan. I mean, I still read Uncle Scrooge. And I, I think that's where I got my love of the adventure story was from uh, Donald Duck and Huey, Dewey and Louie and Scrooge. Um, but I've done, you know, I've done several series with co-authors. Lee Goldberg um, was one, was, you know, one of my favorite series. And it's, it's different, you know, because all of a sudden you're this collaborative person and we start off with an idea and um, I kind of let them run with it. And then I come in at some point and sprinkle a little fairy dust around and, uh, you know, and we end up having a book together and it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a different experience because it's your book, your name is on it, but it's not exactly my book. Um, so, and it's not exactly the co-author's book either, you know, because we become a different person, the two of us. So I sort of, I, I, um, I compare it to like wearing somebody else's underpants, <laughs> you know, it's just not entirely comfortable, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> and you're just hoping it all fits. Like, let's just let the yeah. whole story fit. Let's just let it all come together. You know, yeah. Nelson writing with Alex, who does what? Alex starts, you start. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I uh, I only collaborated one other time with an uh, old friend of mine, Tom Block, U.S. Air Pilot. He, uh, we wrote uh, Mayday together. And then um, uh, we also helped with the movie. There was a TV movie, a CBS TV movie. Uh, we got involved with that a little bit. And, uh, you know, they, it, 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 I, I knew Tom since we were four years old, but this put a strain on the relationship, a, a genuine strain on the relationship. He was a he was a writer besides being a pilot, um, and I'm the pilot. And I'm the writer with the, the part time pilot. Um, we both we both put massive egos to this project, uh, and I so I had this, this sign made uh, from uh, from the French uh, resistance in World War II. It says collaborators will be shot, and I put the sign over my desk. Collaborators will be shot. I didn't do it for 30 years or so, 25 years. And then, um, you know, when Simon Schuster said, would you like to, once you come up with a, a series uh, that you can uh, collaborate with, find a collaborator and we'll do, we'll start a new series. And 
I said, okay, it sounds good, but I, I couldn't think of who the hell I wanted to collaborate with. But then one day, I was just uh, sitting by myself uh, late at night, um, having an adult beverage, and I realized that my son, Alex, was a screenwriter. I don't know how I forgot that. I didn't actually forget it, but it just clicked and said, I said, this kid could do it. He knows the structure of the stories, mm-hmm. his screenplays. One of his uh, one of his films got the comic, got first place in Comic Con. He's very good at what he does. Uh, but so I called him at this ungodly hour, and he said, "He's like, you know, like what? What are you talking about? Uh, it's 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 very very uh, intimidating to write a novel if you're not being asked to write a novel." And he felt very comfortable in his zone, which was screenwriting and, and directing. But um, I think I mentioned the number to him, and the number seemed to wake him up. The number, <laughs> the number had to do with how much can you make on this? Maybe you can pay me my yield tuition back, you know, that kind of thing. So he got excited about it. And um, we already had the series characters. Uh, it was a, a CID, uh, Army Criminal Investigation Division book. We had the two characters of Brody and Taylor. So all he had to do was kind of plug into that and we had to plug into a plot. And he, and he took off with it because he was a screenwriter. So the imagination was there. Just that there's a format. It's quite different, obviously, you know, between a novel and a screenplay. And it's a much longer, uh, you know, format. Um, but he got into it and he, he, he kind of had fun with it. And he's finishing up his second now called Bloodlines. Same two characters. The, the other one was set in Venezuela. This one is set in Berlin. And what we, what we want to do is because they all make criminal investigators, they can go any place in the world where the Americans have a military presence and, um, and operate there. So we're trying to develop a TV series at the same time as we're doing uh, this, this uh, book series. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be good. This is, CID has been done before, but we're doing it a little bit differently. And... Uh, He's learning something, not only about novel writing, but he's learning a little bit about the army that he didn't know. And I was in the army, so I kind of helped him there. But he's a good researcher. And as Jenna said, you know, he let the kid do all the heavy lifting because I don't feel like doing the research. So he can do the, he does the research very quickly. He knows how to do it on the computer. And the uh, same thing, we were going to go to Venezuela for the last book, but uh, because of, partly because of COVID, but because of also uh, just it's a dangerous place. So you have to, you have to pick and choose where you go. When you go to do research, I think Hawaii is a good place to go to do research. <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely that would be a good place to do research completely. So, Jen, you've talked about, I've listened to some interviews that you've done, that you see yourself mostly as an entertainer. You're there to entertain the reader. You're always looking at your book through this lens. So talk to us about what it means to you to be entertaining people as they're reading the books. Um, well, I think, you know, um, people write for different reasons and there are different um, kinds of books. And, you know, some people write the big cathartic book. Um, Some people um, have an agenda that they want to get out there. Um, And for me, I just want to entertain people. I, um, I look at myself as being the happy writer. You know, if you're having a bad day, I'm, I'm the place where you go because my books are about good people. They aren't perfect but they try. My books are about um, family, community. Um, uh, My heroine is tenacious. She's not fantastic at her job, but she manages, she gets through the day. I think that I write books about small heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's heroic to be able to make your mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so and and when I write books, I actually see them as movies. I mean, they're they're very visual for me. Mm-hmm. I started out as I was always the kid that could draw, um, majored in fine arts. I was a painter in college, and then decided that it was too vague. That I liked um, a more specific communication and moved over to writing. And so, um, but I I like my uh, my job. I consider my job to be that of an entertainer. Somebody that, I mean, I think that if, I mean, we all have an agenda. We, we all have values that we put in our books. I think if the reader is too aware of that, then I have failed, you know, because I want them just to start reading and, and love what they're reading and get engrossed in the characters 
and, you know, rip through the book to the end. And so that's, you know, that's just the point of view that I, I have as a writer. So as a result of that, when you're writing, are you thinking pacing? Are you thinking the pace of how to keep it going, how to move it very, very quickly? And is that in your first draft or is that something that happens later on? Yeah, no, pacing is is critical. And um, when I first started writing about 100 years ago, I, uh, I used to do many drafts. Uh, and then as my skills improved and I got to know my voice as a writer a little bit more, um, then that time shortened so that when I'm done with a book, my first draft is pretty much um, the, what you see. I, uh, I take that for, but I'm very slow. I'm a very slow writer. I, um, I do a lot more thinking than typing. You know, I start out at about 530 in the morning and I just, um, uh, you know, put my time in, uh, try to perfect my sentences. I'm very aware of transitions. I think moving the reader from one place to the next, um, changing time frames. Is, if you don't do it seamlessly and easily, it stops the reader. It slows them down. I work very hard at not having that happen. Um, I'm always aware of building blocks, of having a chunk of dialogue, a chunk of action, a chunk of exposition, some narrative, some description, so that there's a lot of variety um, on the pages. It's not just, you know, three pages of narrative. I think that gets boring. Um, the mechanics of writing is, you know, as, aside from telling the story, which is paramount, you have to have wonderful characters and you have to have a story. Um, but there are also the mechanics of writing that make it uh, an enjoyable read, a fast read. I, I don't want my readers to have to sit there and look words up, um, you know, online because they um, because I'm using, you know, words that they don't know. I, I don't. I don't want to slow anybody down. I just want somebody to be able to sit there and um, and have a good time, because we're competing with so many things now that you know years ago, you didn't have to. But people have Facebook available. They have Twitter. They have um, streaming. They have all of these other opportunities to um, take up their time and to entertain them. And, um, and so this is what we're competing with now. And so I'm always aware of that, that the mechanics of the writing have to also, you know, suit the time that we're writing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And things have changed. It has changed since book number one. So much is, you know, available to people you write as distractions at any single moment. Nelson, how do you keep track of what's going on with your ongoing characters? Like you see Corey in your head. But all these other yeah. characters along the way, do you have notes like the Bible, you know, like the Bibles they have on uh, television shows? Or what do you do? No, but it's a good idea. I should have started that uh, 15 years ago with the first Corey book. Um, what I do is I, I kind of reread uh, the prior books. Uh, but you hit on a good point, because once you have a continuing character, as Janet knows, the, the characters dragging a lot of baggage along sometimes and you got to make sure like the basics are right like the character's hair didn't change color and the character was six feet tall in the last book that type of thing uh the, the best source of that is what you had probably you know previously written um but it does get cumbersome because the character said this character has now got a history and the reader you're assuming knows some of the history might not have read everyone, but read a lot of them. And the reader, you know, I, I get so much fan mail, and sometimes you do your market research that way. You also get some, you know, book ideas, and people say, you know, well, what, what happened with John Corey and this guy? They, they're really in, in, involved with the character. And they're kind of saying to me, you know, bring this guy, make this guy full every time. And you can only give so much of the backstory before the reader starts to go, you know, you know buggy-eyed. But yet you want to, you know, you want to honor that past because he is a series character. But you want to move forward at the same time. And it becomes more and more, and I'm seeing it's becoming more and more, more and more of a challenge. I'm up to Corey number eight, and I think, you know, I'm not sure. I keep saying it's the last Corey book, but uh, I don't think it's the last Corey book. Uh, but it's said, and actually, when you read your own book again, especially a series book, you kind of remember the, not just the, the things about the character, but the voice that you used mm -hmm. uh, throughout the you know the, the last book 
and things that Corey said and probably should not say again, or maybe it was good enough to, to repeat. Mm -hmm. So it really is, in many ways, it's episodic, but it's also a long story. A series becomes a long story that should kind of dovetail to some extent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just got to, but you got to read your own stuff. And, and I'm going to go back to the, what, the Plum Island, which I did recently reread because The Maze is kind of a, a takeoff or a sequel to Plum Island. Um, there was some good stuff in there, some nuggets. I was surprised myself, but I, you know, I made notes of them and I tagged them in the book. And so they, they reappear again in, uh, uh, in The Maze. And it's kind of, I mean, it's, 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 it's it, it, if I had my choice, I would write standalone novels, which you're creating the world from the beginning, you get the beginning, middle, end, you're done, you wrote the words at the end, and never have to see these characters or this plot or this milieu ever again. Um, the readers, however, the readers love the series. So, you know, commercially, it's not a bad idea. And also, we always, you know, we're not, we, we always have one eye to a TV, you know, the series characters. And uh, so many of these characters and novels have been turned into very successful, uh, you know, TV series. So you think about that too. Uh, I'm pulled two different ways. And um, and I don't do Corey book on top of Corey book. I usually try to, mm -hmm. you know, I try to break it up with another kind of book. Yeah. And I get a lot of respect for people you know, uh, like Janet and other people, I don't know, like, you know, Lee, Lee Child, my friend, who can keep it the same character, keep it fresh every time. Keeping it fresh is not, not easy when you're doing a series. Um, and, you know, they, they say if the, reader, if, if the writer's not having fun, the reader's not having fun. So I have to have fun with John Corey, and that's why he's, uh, he's irreverent, he's funny, he's this, he's that. Um, but I'm not just playing with words. I'm really trying to make the guy... Uh, appealing to the reader. So we're talking about before the competition. I think it was Robert Heinlein who said, the, the novelist is competing for people's beer money. And that's really what it comes down to. We're competing for people's beer money. And it better be good. And every one of them has got to sound fresh and engaged. It's got to be entertaining. And if you want to tell a, if you want to give a little bit of your philosophy of life while you're at it or remark about the world that we live in, fine. But, you know, bottom line, it's got to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's got to have some kind of a pace to it as well. Like this right. moving, especially books have had to get faster recently because everything is so quick of what's going on. You know, Janet, what I was thinking is so much in tech has changed over the years. The things that would take her so long to figure out before, you can figure out pretty out quickly now. How's that changed what your writing is? Because it's on top of every single new tech thing that's happening. Um. It, it really hasn't affected my, my writing a lot. Um, I, you know, I, and I would like to get back to this business about pacing because one thing that hasn't been said is um, you just don't put filler in your writing. I mean, that really is, is critical when you want to make your reader move through the book is that every sentence really should move the book forward. You don't, you don't, um, you don't have a lot of, you know, uh, fluff in between there. And, um, but I think, you know, the creative process and the writing for me hasn't changed. A lot of things in the business has changed, but, um, you know, I still write the story um, very much like when, when I first started, which is, you know, I kind of have a three act story. Um, I like the you know, 90,000 pages, um, I, I like, which is, you know, a shorter, a medium length book. And, um, you know, I mean, the research has gotten easier with Google, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, but the creative process, you know, is still the same because people are the same. And that's what it's really all about. You know, mm -hmm. it's really all about people. I mean, mm -hmm. the plot to me is, you know, just the train tracks that mm -hmm. the train runs on. I, so I, when, I, I've never been accused of, of having a really great plot. <laughs> do you have any kind of an outline before you start writing, Jen, or do you just sit down and start writing? Was there, do you know where it's going to end? Do you know what's going to happen along the way? Or I'm making up as go, folks. <laughs> yeah, no, I start out with a very, with a very brief outline. 
Um, I know how it's going to begin. I know how it's going to end. I know a couple um, things that are going to happen in the middle. I know what I want to accomplish with the relationships with the characters. Uh, I know who the bad guys are. And then, um, but I, but I don't have, you know, like a 12 page outline. I mean, this Mm -hmm. consists of maybe um, two or three pages of scribbles. And, but what I do is I start the book. And then when I go to bed at night, I go to bed with a steno pad and I make notes of what I wrote during that day. And then I make notes about where I want to go tomorrow when I wake up Mm -hmm. and something happens, you know, it's like, um, I th- I always think of my head as a big stew pot and you throw in, you know, all the meat and the vegetables and it cooks overnight and then you wake up and it's gravy. <laughs> and, um, and that's what I end up in the morning. You know, I've got, I've got the gravy uh, because something happens uh, between the time I've written it in my steno pad and I get up and have coffee in the morning. And that, that kind of is the way that I move through the book is, uh, you know, kind of day by day. Mm-hmm. And there's a start. There's something, oh, I know where I'm going tomorrow morning when I wake up, as opposed to it used to be the worst. Remember when Word was there and it was that blinking screen, that little blinking light that would sit there and stare at you and you sit there on, I have nothing. I have nothing to say. And it'd be like right there. And that's what I always think about. If you don't know where you're going to go in the morning, that blinking light is you can still see it in your head. Yeah. Disaster. Yeah. <laughs> disaster is going to strike. How, how about you, Nelson? Do you work off an outline or do you like know what the end is going to be or? Uh, an outline, no, uh, no, I don't. Uh, but you know, you, you kind of want to turn a memo in before you start the book, so the editor knows what you like to do. You know, theoretically, um, you've had a editorial discussion ahead of time. Um, I used to write more extensive outlines, but I saw that I wasn't following them because if you're following an outline, it's like you know what the future is going to be, but you really don't. So you, if you too. If you, if you stick to an outline too tightly, you're missing opportunities to branch off and go here or there. But neither do you want the book to, to, to wander. But I usually turn in five or six pages, maybe 10 tops. And that's to the editor so that they can, you know, at least get an idea of where it's, where it's going. Um, um, the old fashioned outline, I don't know, it, it works for some people. Do I know where the book's going to start? Yeah, I guess, you know, I know where it's going to start. I always have that scene. The middles tend to sag a little bit unless you tighten them up. And it's good to know the ending. Um, um, when you know the ending, you can work toward that ending. Mm-hmm. Um, with some of my books, I didn't know where it was going to end. And I think of The General's Daughter, which if you've seen the movie, um, the ending, the movie ending is a little bit different than the book ending. They always change it anyway. But it was, it was a murder mystery, classical kind of murder mystery. And I was not a, I'm not a murder mystery writer, so I, I was I was kind of intrigued with the process of Agatha Christie. Like these things are so perfect, and I was really having fun with it uh, with the, the general's daughter until I realized that I didn't know I didn't I didn't know who the murderer was. And I had no idea where the hell this thing was going to go. I got to about the three quarter mark, and I realized that I didn't even drop a clue who this the bad guy who could who murdered the general's daughter. Um, so I had to go back. Then I finally figured it out. I had to go back, plant the clues, that type of thing. Um, and it was time consuming. It's good to know the ending, but sometimes the ending that you think, you know, is not as good as the one that suggests itself as you're writing the book. And you don't want this, you don't want to play with the reader's mind by having these silly twists at the end where, you know, the guy's mother was all, all, all along the murder, the murderess. Or the murderer. Uh, no, you can you can get away with a little bit at the end, but you can't insult the reader's intelligence either. It should have a, you know the, the the ending should obviously grow organically out of the story. There should not be two different things. Um, and as you know, every every author will attest, it's the ending where the author and the editors sometimes butt heads. It's always the ending. It's, there is no perfect ending, but there is a better ending sometimes. And you see this in the movies, too. And I've seen this in screenplays that were written uh, based on my books. Um, this is the biggest challenge. This is the last thing the reader is going to read and the last thing the you know the TV viewer is going to see and hear is the ending. And that'll, that's got to be powerful. 
Uh, my endings tend to be ambiguous. We're not quite sure what happened. And that's my style, but I get a lot of criticism. Oh, you know, you, you, we did what happened with TWA? Who, who blew the plane up? Well, we don't know in real life, so how do I know in, in fiction? Um, ambiguity is good. It doesn't have to be cut and dry. It doesn't have to be a Hollywood ending. We all know what Hollywood ending means. Um, and um, I think, you know, sometimes even a, even a mediocre book could be saved by one hell of an ending kind of thing. And uh, uh, so you should have it in mind. It's, it's more important than a lot of writers want to, want to, want to admit. A lot mm -hmm. of writers say, you know, we want to get there, but you know, you got to get, it's best to know where you're going before you try to get there. So uh, the short and long and short of it is, it's good to have in your mind, short outline, beginning, middle, end, and then sit down and get to work. Yeah. You know, I, I talked to a lot of authors many times. I sit there and they said, I had no idea. I had nothing. I had no idea where this was going at the end. And they said, they're meeting with the editor as they're turning some pages in. And the editor goes, do you know where this is going? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I really know. And they said, no <laughs> idea what I was going to do. No right. idea what I was going to pull off. You know, Janet, with the numbers, you always have in mind, okay, it's one for the money. Do you always know like what the number is going to have after it? Have you thought that through in advance? Yeah, no, that was really a mistake. Um, we, we couldn't, we're, I'm missing the title, Gene. I'm not real great at titles. And so that first book, um, somebody said, well, obviously it has to be one for the money, you know, because um, it was the first book and I wrote it because I needed money. And then um, the second one came and the third one, and it was, you know, one for the money, two for the uh, show, three to get, you know, that kind of thing. And so then by the time the fourth book came, we were stuck with these stupid numbers and it just had to continue. And for a long time, we ran contests where the readers would submit names and we would pick one out of a hat, you know, kind of, and that would be the title of the book. And, you know, we really didn't care if it had anything to do with the book because it was, you know, it was just too complicated and it didn't matter anyway. Um, and so it got to be about, I don't know, maybe book 15. And I was like, oh man, I really got to get rid of these numbers. Nobody would let me. It got to be book 20. Nobody wanted to get rid of the numbers. I was like, I'm feeling really old here. I've got, you know, Stephanie Plum at, at one book I wrote it. And I think she was, I don't know, what was she? She was complaining um, about because she felt like she was 60 years old. Yes, she was 60 <laughs> years old. <you> know? <laughs> but aged. Stephanie, of course, never ages in the series. And so finally, finally, a couple of years ago, uh, they agreed to, we still keep the numbers in a little subtitle, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, for, I think, what, the last three books, we've been able to get away from that and have a, a title that actually, you know, meant something for the book. And uh, so I'm, I, I love, I love this new format with the title and then the number, you know, and smaller letters underneath. Mm -hmm. So if you get lost, it's like, oh yeah, it's book 29. That's right. That's, that's, that's 29 folks. That's right. That's well, you right. have to know for your collection, you know, it has to be right <laughs> up on the shelf. Exactly. And right on time, we're going to go to audience questions. And I have to tell you, I had a lot of fun going through figuring out which ones I was going to share with you. Um, here's a good one to start for both of you. Karen asks, are you as sarcastic and quick-witted as your characters? John Corey and Grandma Mazur have some of the best lines. Do you save it for the pages or do your friends and family get it firsthand? Nelson, I'm going to start with you on that one. <laughs> well, you know, am I that sarcastic? Yes. Uh, that quick. Uh, maybe I'd like to be quicker, you know, in the situation when it arises. We all wish we'd said something, but when you're writing a novel, you, the, the, you have the magic of being able to freeze frame it. Uh, somebody says something to John Corey. Now, John Corey comes back like that, but that that might have taken me five minutes of staring at this blank page saying, what is the perfect uh, rejoinder to what, the, what it was, was just said? Um, but it's my personal, again, it's, it's probably the New York math, and I grew up with it, and... Uh, it, it kind of travels well around the country, too. Um, some people don't like sarcasm. Some people don't like John Corey. They say he's abrasive, he's caustic, but he had a big heart. And a lot of people who are sarcastic, you know, that's kind of their shtick. That's kind of a little bit of a, a, a comedy thing. Uh, but again, being quick, uh, we're not, nobody's that quick. We 
The writers can just freeze it and you know, go go get a cup of coffee and take a walk and come back and then come up with that quick line that actually took a half an hour to you know to get on the page. <laughs> So how about you and grandma? Any, any ten tendencies, anything that says the same? Yeah, it, um, it, it takes me a while to be clever and funny. I'm not, you know, necessarily instantly clever and funny. So, um, but I see humor everywhere. I, the humor is always the easy part of the book for me. The serious parts I have to really think about. The humor is just there. I'm always the person laughing at the wrong moment, you know, Um and um, but for the most part, I, it takes me a while to get that humor on the page. Now, if you give me a glass of wine, I mean, I that really, you know, that gets the program rolling. <laughs> if you if you put me in a party situation and you give me two glasses of wine, I'm dancing on the tabletop, you know, and cracking jokes. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's all it takes, folks, is wine. Just remember, if you ever see Janet, that's all it's going to take. And that's right. You want a good time, just get me all boozed up. And I'm that's fun. <laughs> You've got a really interesting question about Wesley's asking, do you ever listen to the audio productions of your books after they've been made? I'm always curious about authors' impressions of readers' versions of the characters in the story. Some of the audiobook readers do an amazing job. And along the same lines, Everett asks, if audio listening has changed anything, about the way you write with regards to story or dialogue. Nelson, you want to take that one first? Do you listen to the audiobooks? I do, yeah. And Scott Brick is uh, my narrator for the John Corey, and he's sort of the, the voice of John Corey. He does a good job of it. Um, a very good job, I should say. But he's also done some of my other books. Um, yeah, and I get, like, I get uh, as much fan mail sometimes for Scott Brick as I do for Nelson the Mill. I yeah, listen to the audio book, Scott, audio book. Scott Brick is really terrific. Well, hold on, I wrote the book. He just <laughs> read it, you know. But he's good at it. He, he likes the character, which helps. Um, but the the question, does it change the way I write? No, I, I never heard that question before. But it's an interesting question. I don't think, you know, um, I can't, can't imagine a writer changing the way he or she would write based on audio, but maybe when you listen to it, subconsciously you pick up a better sense of pacing, and that may have something to do with it. Like you can, when it's, you know, when it's verbal, when it's, you know, when it's, it's being narrated, some of the defects of, in the book, some of the long, you know, expo, expository, you know, uh, speeches or whatever, uh, become more obvious because it's, you know, it's being said. You can, you know, when you're reading, all of us, when we're reading a, a very dense paragraph, we know we can skip. But if you're listening, you got to listen to the whole thing. And maybe there's some feedback there uh, in terms of the pacing. If it starts to sound too long on the tape, I realize that I could have probably tightened that up on mm -hmm. the page. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jen, how about you? Do you listen to audio? Yeah, I do. And um, Lorelai King does almost all of my stuff now. She's the voice of Stephanie. She's fantastic. She's turned out to be a good friend um, because we have this long history together now. In the beginning, I had several uh, different readers that were uh, Stephanie. And um, because they were taking actresses and they would move on to better gigs, you know, than reading Stephanie Plum. But Lorelai has stuck with me and I, I think she's great. Um, I, I don't... I, I don't think that I've changed anything about um, the way that I write um, after listening to audio, with the exception of because Laurel and I are um, good friends. You know, sometimes I do things that that I know she's gonna, uh, you know, gonna have to uh, pause about. Like I had a character, um, and his name was, and I can't remember it exactly because it was several books ago, but the last name was spelled, um, I think it was uh, F U K. And so, um, or maybe it was F-U-C-H. At any rate, uh, you know, every time she would come to that name, she'd just crack up because she didn't know what to say, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was it was it Fuchs? No. <laughs> was, it, <laughs> was it Fudge? No. And so, um, so, I, so I have fun with it, you know, that way. And every now and then I'll think about Lorelai when I'm writing and put something <laughs> in there that I know she's going to have to enjoy. 
<laughs> she have to figure out, oh, well, she got me again. She got me again. You know, I've had a couple of authors say they read aloud to hear how many times they say the same word over and over. And they said, sometimes when you're listening on audio, it's like, how many times did I say that word? Really? Did I put it down that many times on the page? Which is kind of funny. So for Nelson, I've got a question. Michael shared, when someone asks me for my favorite Nelson DeMille book, I always declare a three-way tie. Charm School, Gold Coast, Nightfall. Do any of your books stand out to you as your clear favorite? Yeah, Gold Coast. Uh, you know, it was a book that um, it's uh, described as the um, uh, Jay Gatsby meets the Godfather, set on the North Shore of Long Island, where I live, or I live close to the Gold Coast, but not in the Gold Coast. Uh, you know, it's very historical. It's the, you know, the Roaring Twenties uh, made the Gold Coast famous. Uh, I had fun with the book. It's, um, uh, you know, and I, they say, you know, if you have the reader, if the author's having fun, the reader's going to have fun. Uh, these were my neighbors. These are people I knew. And um, I enjoyed you know, lampooning them to some extent. And some people deserved it. And maybe other people didn't. But it was like sort of, in many ways, you know, um, not certainly not autobiographical, but it was my hometown kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was banned from three clubs after <laughs> after I wrote the book. I was actually banned from three country clubs because I mentioned them in a negative way in the book. But um, and it was an easy book to write. I think the ones that are torturous, you have kind of bad memories of. Gold Coast just came out of the pencil like it was, you know, like I had the whole thing in my head, and uh, mm -hmm. I needed to write this book. It was also the one that. Editorially, my editors, uh, Warner Books in those days, did not want that book written. They said it wasn't a DeMille book, and it's not a DeMille book. Uh, not enough action adventure, not enough this, not enough that. A lot, a lot of negative, you know, but you always want to, you want the editors and the publisher to have some skin in the game, but this one, this time they didn't. They, they, they said I was, you know, I was being stubborn, but I wrote it and became a huge bestseller, became a classic. It's taught in college as an adjunct book with uh, Great Gatsby, and um, but I knew this book was good. You know, a lot of times we start out where uh, writers have so many uh, insecurities. This is the book that I, when I sat down and started writing it, I realized that it's going to be easy, it's going to be fun, it's going to be a great book, and mm -hmm. it lived up to my expectations and everybody else's. Uh, so that's my favorite. The other one would be probably up country because it's partly and word of honor uh two books about vietnam and i served in vietnam so these were in, in some ways difficult books to write uh they were kind of cathartic in one way but they were they were, they were difficult they, they brought back some memories that you know i that i i purposely had to um you know revisit this place uh not only mentally but i went back Vietnam in 1997 with a couple other vets. We went to our old battlefields and that type of thing. And it was a good thing. It was a good thing. It was good to see the country at peace. Um, and, um, you know, we kind of chased away a lot of ghosts. So, you know, when I wrote Word of Honor and when I wrote Up Country, um, I felt that uh, this was a genuine book, an honest book. It's mm -hmm. the way I saw the war. And it wasn't political. I didn't get any complaints from the left or the right on this book, which is, that's when you know you've done a good job, or if you get equal complaints. Um, I, I wrote it the way I saw it, and uh, those are the two books maybe I'm most proud of. They're both Vietnam books. Uh, the one that was the most fun that I'd like to see on, this, on the big screen one day is The Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a screenplay, if anybody out there is a producer, I got a screenplay for you. I got a screenplay for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so Janet, I got two related questions. Tracy asks, how do you think of all the different ways to blow up Stephanie's vehicles? And Cheryl asks, has anyone determined the dollar value of all the cars destroyed or damaged when Stephanie is around? So there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I get a, a lot of joy out of blowing up cars on the page and um, you know, Sometimes I don't blow them up. You know, one car was smashed by a, a cement truck and rolled over it. And um, I don't know. You know, I blew up a car in the first book. And then 
I just really enjoyed it. And so it just got to be a thing. Like how many cars can I blow up in a book? You know, how many cars can I <laughs> destroy? And uh, yeah, I, I've never really thought about the dollar value of them, but I'm sure it would add up uh, because she uh, tends to blow up Ranger's cars sometimes and he has very expensive cars. So yeah. Okay. I think that could be a reader thing. Somebody needs to go through that and let me know. There you go. I think there's an assignment for everybody tonight. Just go out and go see what you figure out with these books. Because I yeah. think that would be, I think that's a good assignment for us to be leaving everybody with right now. How's that? Yeah. So everybody, thank you so much. Janet Nelson, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been so much fun. And I think that you've shared so much with the readers that, you know, you really didn't know about. And I think everybody's got some takeaways. I'm hoping everybody's found some books they want to go read. They want to go buy and they want to go be talking about. Thank you to all of the book festivals around the country who partnered with Simon & Schuster to bring you this program. Um, and to everybody who contributed questions, you were over the top. They were absolutely great. Love seeing not only the, your, the, the, the questions that you wrote, but your passion for both of these authors and their work. And there was such a diverse group of questions. I wish we could have even gotten to more of them. So thank you for that. And to everyone, we wish you a very good night. I'm heading off to read. I hope you're off heading off to read, shop, and buy some more books as well. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. <laughs>